Good morning, everyone. Had a wonderful time with my daughter. Got all kinds of things done. I got sawdust. And she went up the hill, got us water, so I could cancel getting water. <laughs> yes. Okay. Saved a little money. Yeah. And finally... The transfer of my car to her is done. It took a year, I think. <laughs> oh, dear me. You would think that some things should still be kind of simple to do, right? Yes. But it's so complicated. Not even, it, it's, and it isn't even, it wasn't even a transfer from like, going out of state or something, it was in state, but in a different county, and it was just, what a mess, uh, or, or just how complicated can something be, right, yes, yeah, and, and on top of that, no one seems to know, people in charge, or, yeah, okay, seem to know everything, all of it, in a way, right, it, it, you, you're getting all these different answers, to one question, right? Can I register this car if I if the paperwork's all there, notarized and everything, in a, in another place, right? Yes, uh, you. Anyway, weird, just weird. It's just, gosh, you know, it almost felt like emotional harassment, right? Okay, it's, it's all done. It wasn't, right? but. Ugh. The whole process. I remember when I was younger, living in California, dealing with the DMV, was probably one of the worst moments in my life. You know, to just, oh my gosh, just, can't you, could you not have told me that ahead of time, that I also need that form, and this thing, and I don't know what. No, you go there three or four times to do the same thing. Because every time someone tells you one more thing, or didn't tell you something beforehand, whatever. Right? Okay, I'm just saying. DMV, I betcha that if people were to really think about it, it's probably one of the worst experiences of everyone's life. The DMV. <laughs> I'm just saying. But it was, it got done. It's all taken care of now. Hopefully. <laughs> ah, which brought me to, to, uh, which brings me to another thing where, you know, when you, when you kind of have experienced both sides, right? Yes. Talking cops, cops and robbers. When you've experienced both sides in a way where you have to say it's really amazing on how the police out there, um, anyone working in law enforcement is out there risking their lives. And yes, they are every day. OK, well, I keep it a little more safer for us. Well, yeah, you know, uh, sad that we actually need that at all, but we do. And it's sad on how in the past so many years, it seems as if the protection that the common people have in certain places seems to be for the criminals. Okay, well, 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 the, 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 the reason they are, okay, then the excuses start, right? The reason why these young people turn out that way is, is because, and then here, you know, the, the cops don't make it easier for them, actually. And then, of course, there is that factor of, yeah, we're being targeted because of our skin color. And Okay. You know what? It's a weird one. It's an absolutely weird one to me. I'm not getting that. I can't see on how protecting gang members in your in your neighborhood is of any benefit to anyone 
I can't. And that the police have to be so afraid to go into certain neighborhoods for their lives. I'm not getting either because there's other people living there. They're not afraid. They're there. Well, they don't have anywhere else to go. Really? Okay. I'm just saying. It's a weird imbalance going on there with people's, why did you get to that point where you think that being surrounded by crime is safer for you? Right? Yes? All right. Well, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. And while we're doing that, as people who are not doing anything criminal, this and that, we're supporting the ones who are bringing the drugs in, distributing the drugs that are killing a lot of people too. All right, aha, now I brought up two other sides. There, there are, right, again, a lot of young people who are dying of drugs because of drugs, these really potent drugs, not just it's younger people too. Well, the, on the others, there's, there's all age groups as well. And... Uh, and then the criminals who are bringing the drugs in. Then the ones that distribute and sell them. I find it weird that, okay, now what, which side are you going to take? The side of the criminals again? Aha. Uh -huh. Well, people could just say no to drugs, right? Yeah, okay. Aha. Uh -huh. Are you seeing the odd? Huh? There's a comparison right there. Where again, well, so what now? It seems as if it it just because we're mad at the system, DMV, <laughs> mad at the system, unhappy with the system, disillusioned and frustrated with the system, we're taking it out on people who don't deserve it. Yes? All right. There are a few bad apples everywhere. When, on the side of goodness, yes, there are. They're very well disguised sometimes, or they think that they can take the law, working for the law, the law into their own hands. Are they prejudiced and this and that? Yeah, and, uh -huh. yeah, absolutely. But it's a few of them, and they can be reported. All right, so I had this experience, huh? and uh, with my daughter driving, a few years ago, I remember Danny was just like two or three years old, and there was another friend with us, and we had just gotten out of Lowe's, uh, and uh, we were sitting in the car, just about ready to go, right? Danny was in her car seat strapped in, we were all strapped in, and uh, then there is a cop car comes, right? down the line just before we pull out of the parking spot and uh, and Danny wanted something to drink so here I am I'm, 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 I'm reach down for the bottle of water you know and then hand it back there and and uh, and and Chloe waits until the, the police car has passed us and then pulls out well would you know we didn't make it out of the whole compound there we just were just onto the parkway, and that cop's behind us stopping us. Chloe's like, Mom, what did I do? I said, well, as far as I know, he didn't do anything. So let's see what he wants. So we pull over, and he comes over and rolls down the window. I need to see license and registration. I said, excuse me, first of all, I said, why did you stop us? What did she do wrong? He says, she didn't do anything wrong. You, me. I was fidgeting in the car while he was driving by. I said, are you serious? I said, I reached down for a bottle of water to give to my granddaughter. And then he tried to come up with some other reason why he stopped us. And uh, I knew better than my daughter was driving, and I knew better than to start anything with a baby in the car, this and that. So I just said, okay, so what is it? So what What else What else is there? Uh, so he tried to explain, well, you know, you kind of, the way you were acting in the car while he was driving by is kind of like drug addicts do. I don't do drugs. Absolutely, 100% not. 
I said, really? Mm. Then he came up with something of our tail light or whatever. Then he looked in the back, make sure that everybody had their seatbelt on, the baby was strapped in proper. as I said. And then she says, I'm just going to let you go with a warning. I almost wanted to say, what warning for what exactly? Yeah. Uh, so, all right. We kept on going. My daughter was a wreck, right? More, probably more so because she was worried I'd say be saying more. Okay. <laughs> Anywho, kept on going. It was fine. And, uh, oh, I had to hold it in. I was so T.O.'d <laughs> over the whole thing. But to calm my daughter down, kind of, I said, hey, you know, it's better to, that they stop one too many than, uh, you know, possibly have people on the road who are high on drugs while they're driving, so, and then cause a big old accident with death, dead people, right? Yes? But again, people think that, oh, it's just one group of people that's being, or two groups of people that's being, or three groups of people that are being targeted sometimes for certain things because of the what the way they look how about the car we drive right that was a that's an old car a very very old car but it's all paid off and it's all legal on the road it's all good it's all it's where everything's working fine right yes but it's an old car right it's not a fancy car I always find that interesting when you get, you know, when, when also that kind of comes to mind. Oh, you're getting stopped because you drive a funky car. So you've got to be into funky stuff, right? If I were a cop, I'd say, well, that's probably someone that works really hard and saves their money uh, for something else than buying a big old fancy car. Right? Yes? Yeah? I'd say people who are selling drugs, they snap, make a lot of money with it, aren't driving a junker. <laughs> I'm just saying. Well, anyway. So, yeah, no, it's, it, it's depending on maybe where you live, it's possibility. Yeah? Maybe one has to look at the crime that's going on around you or certain things. And then have, one just has to say, well, yeah, the reason I stopped is because some of us, my people, with certain things, have a bad reputation. And then when the people around the bad people with bad reputations support that re bad reputation, well, guess what? It's kind of difficult to know who's who anymore. Right? So are people out there expecting... Huh? Police, policemen to know? By what? If you're a good or a bad guy? That you have good or bad intentions about five minutes down the road? I'm just saying, right? Yes, it's a weird one. Yes, we got some bad apples there. Huh? We do. But in the way that that is all being portrayed often now, I'm sorry, not going for it. If you're protecting criminals, you're a bad apple too. Done. Okay. Well, anyway, on either side, it doesn't matter whose side it is. I don't care. I believe that a lot of the drugs that are coming into our country are coming into this country so easily, but they can't find... I'm telling you what, they can find a few marijuana plants, right? Yeah, and around here, right, they can find a few marijuana plants totally hidden away, this, not, no problems, right? Yes, but they, they can't find big old shipments of cocaine, heroin, what's called fentanyl, uh, whatever else they bring in. They can't find that. Yeah, all right. You guys go believe that. I don't believe that. But anyway... The best thing still that I can teach with all that is, if you got nothing to hide, you shouldn't worry about a cop sh uh, stopping you, okay? You just don't. Then you behave properly, right? Yeah, well, you heard how I wanted to react, right? I realized with whom I was in there. And and then afterwards, you know, calming my daughter down, I mean, okay, I had to say to myself, well, you got to... You, Again, you've got to see the bigger picture rather than just the inside of your own car, right? Yes, 
And how many times has this happened where a, a young person wants to mouth off or, or uh, not do what you're supposed to do, right? Yes, when you're being stopped and you're starting to behave suspiciously rather than I've got my driver's license, I've got my registration, my insurance. It's all right here, officer. Okay, done. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so there is that, because you never know, right? Yes? Yeah. So if you got nothing to hide, right, yeah? Hmm. And just say no to drugs. Something goes awfully fast out of business when the people don't want it anymore. Just saying. Okay, we are in the second book of Kings. 16. The reign of Ahaz in Judah, 736 to 716. In the 17th year of Pekah, son of Remaliah, Ahaz, son of Yotam, became king of Judah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of mixed up some they're bringing up the king of Israel and the king of Judah several times here where it switched in 15. And I kind of realized later on that I got really mixed up with all that. And again, why are they writing it down so mixed up? Right? Well, to show who was. I, mean, I, I got it. But as I said, considering it's supposed, to, it's supposed to be one united Israel and they have all this confusion going on in this mess with their kings, should tell us something. Ah, right there. Okay, right. Uh, I knew I started with that other one to begin with. Ahaz was 20 years old when he came to the throne and he reigned for 16 years in Jerusalem. He did not do what Yahweh his God regards as right, as his ancestor David had done. But David didn't do right either. Eich. He followed the example of the kings of Israel, even causing his son to pass through the fire of sacrifice, also copying the disgusting practices of the nations whom Yahweh had dispossessed for, dispossessed for the Israelites. Uh, okay, wow. Pass through the fire of sacrifice. Well, now here, and also, it, it's kind of funny. Okay, so this is another king of Judah, and this king here, Ahaz, he's doing things the same as Israel. Oh, well, there they are, united and all that. That's, that's something. <laughs> he offered sacrifices and incense on the high places, on the hills, and under every luxuriant tree. Oh, these high places, so it sounds like, according to... The sacrifices we just heard that were okay. And then he continued that on the high places. So the high places actually weren't worship places for God. They were definitely idol worship for other stuff. Ah, well, that's cleared up now. Sounds like it, doesn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Then it was that Razon, king of Aram, and Pekah, son of Remalia, king of Israel, launched their campaign against Jerusalem. Oh yeah, well, you read about that beforehand. They besieged it, but could not reduce it. At that time, the king of Edom recovered Elot for Edom. He drove the Judeans out of Elot, Elot, and the Edomites occupied it and have been there ever since. Uh... Wow, you know, I really feel for the Israelites. They're just common people. They must have been on the war path all the time. Ugh. <laughs> Ahaz then sent messengers to Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, to say, I am your servant and your son. Your son? Ooh, I wonder if the his mother somehow was related to the king of Assyria. Come and rescue me from the king of Aram and the king of Israel, who are making war on me. Oh, <laughs> are you getting this too? So, okay, so I think I got this right. So, 
Ahaz is of Judah, right? So he went and he had that other king of Aram help him, hey, let's go and take down Jerusalem, right? Fight against the, the king of Israel. And then the king of Israel goes <laughs> and gets help. <laughs> and now Aram goes and says, hey, they're making war against me. <laughs> well, who started it? <laughs> <laughs> man i tell you what reading this and what i talked before i started reading this is like wow okay if that coincidences don't exist all right all right and ahas took what silver and gold was to be found in the temple of yahweh in the palace treasury and sent this as a present to the king of Assyria. wow okay the king of Assyria granted his request and, marching on Damascus, captured it. He deported its population to Kir and put Razan to death. Whoops. When King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Tiglot Pileser, king of Assyria, he saw the altar which was in Damascus. King Ahaz then sent a picture and model of the altar with details of its construction to Uriah the priest. Uriah the priest constructed the altar. All the instructions sent by King Ahaz from Damascus were carried out by Uriah the priest before King Ahaz returned from Damascus. Wow, what? When, uh, when, ki when the king arrived from Damascus, he inspected the altar, he approached it and ascended it. And on the altar he made his burnt offering and his oblation. He poured out his libation and sprinkled the blood of his communion sacrifices. The altar which used to stand before Yahweh, he removed from the front of the temple where it had stood between the new altar and the temple of Yahweh and placed it at the north side of the new altar. King Ahaz gave this order to Uriah the priest. In future you will present the morning burnt offering the evening oblation, the king's burnt offering and oblation, the burnt offering, the oblation, and the libations of all the people of the country on the large altar. On it you will pour out all the blood of the burnt offerings and sacrifices. As regards the bronze altar, I shall see to that. Uriah the priest did everything that King Ahaz had offered or ordered. Wow, what's going on here? God's being replaced. King Ahaz broke up the wheeled stance. Now it's not even just not following God's guidance. Right? Now, whatever in the physical world, God kind of asked to be put in place, or certain things anyway, that, so that the people remember, right? Yeah, God's covenant mm, is what's happening. So there are people wondering what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. I think we know very well what happened to the Ark of the Covenant by now when we read this right? it can't be found why because it was destroyed hmm. king ahas broke up the wheeled stands removed the cross pieces and the basins from them and took the bronze sea off the oxen supporting it and rested it on the stone pavement and from the temple of yahweh in deference to the king of Assyria, he removed the dais for the throne which had been built inside and the royal entrance on the outside. The rest of the history of Ahaz's entire career is this not recorded in the book of Annals of the kings of Judah? I guess. Then Ahaz fell asleep with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. His son Hezekiah succeeded him. That's it. Whoa. Amazingly enough, it doesn't say anywhere. It just says what the kings did. It doesn't say anywhere. What did the, pe the people were fine with that? Well, the people were still doing what? Offering sacrifices on the high places, this and that. So this, this, this pleasing Yahweh or not pleasing Yahweh, the high priests working with the kings or against the kings, which ones were actually, yeah, the, 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 the priests of the idols, a ball, a all, a ball, a all. <laughs> it seems like, did the commoners have any idea what was going on, really? Except for, it seems as if, 
they were actually still doing what also displeased Yahweh very much, which was worshiping idols. It's a, it's a, it's an, I mean, interesting. It's absolutely frustrating to read all this, in in a way. Oh, there it is. The reigns of Ahaz in Judah. And on how what a mess. It's a total mess. Does anybody know any any <laughs> okay? Why did I start at people on the side of goodness? Can they even still keep some kind of an order to snap? Yes. Because the mess is going on within. The mess is going on outside. And on the outside, the mess is going on within on the outside as well. Right? It's a mess everywhere. And uh, then on top of that, when you have people playing both sides in a way, okay, that's even, that's, now we got, a super mess. Yes. All right. Well, it is as it is, but it's kind of interesting when, when, uh, right. Uh, which one was it? Samuel went to God and had a vision. We'll just talk to God. And say, hey, the people want a king. They see everybody else has a king out there. They want one too. God says, well, I'll give them what they want, but I'm telling you, it's going to turn into a mess. And turned into a super mess. Yep. Got a sneeze. That's all I have to talk to you about this morning because I got a sneeze. Well, let's sneeze then. Hey, shoo! Boom. Ah, feels good to sneeze, doesn't it? Yeah. All right. That's all I have to share this morning. Yes. I think that when we live with our surroundings, where we live, who we live with, who our family is, what our community is like, right? Yes, what our community needs, truly needs, we should we should maybe find our way through that maze before we just hang ourselves and our attitude. Yes? onto someone else to kind of what do the job for us or or not or we hope that they will do something or not or right i think it's a good idea for every one of us right, to find that way that path through the mess yeah? and be honest on what actually is going on around us. And who deserves our support. Yes? Yeah. And then start to inform yourself. Uh, I heard a good one. And uh, I'm, I'm guilty of it too. I do call some people stupid. I just can't help. I mean, it's like, oh, yeah, I can't help it. Of course I can help it. But they're just stupid. And I heard a good one where... Where uh, a grandmother said to a, a, a young person, a young man, a young boy, a young man, he's a teenager, who I uh, guess grew up in a way where he was told a lot that he was just stupid. Yes? Mm. And she, t and he said, yeah, I'm, I'm, then he kind of got a chance to be in an environment that was nurturing and healthy for him. And uh, he ended up doing better in school. Oopsie. Yeah. And I came home and kind of said, yeah, I, I used to think I was stupid. And this grandmotherly woman to this boy, though not the grandmother, said, there is no such thing as stupid. Just uneducated. Oh. 
uneducated. Okay. Yeah. So, you're uneducated. A lot of people are uneducated out there. Yes. So, educate yourself. Hmm? All right. It's going to happen little by little, little by little, little by little. We have little ones. Huh? That should be the most important thing to everyone out there to protect their little ones. Yes? Not hoodlums. Une uneducated hoodlums out there. All right. Okay. You're a certain age. You still do certain things. You are a hoodlum. Done. Okay. Not changing my mind on that. I got re-educated on stupid. But that's it for now. <laughs> All right. See? Still willing to learn. There. All right. That's all I have to share this morning. God's love and blessings always. May he protect you. And I will talk to you all another time.